Did you approve of the Nixon pardon when President Ford granted it? Do you approve of it now? And if the issue was fair game in your 1974 campaign in Kansas, why is it not an appropriate topic now? Well, it's, <clears throat> it is an appropriate topic, I guess, but it's not a very good issue any more than the war in Vietnam would be or World War II or World War I or the war in Korea, all Democrat wars, all in this century. I figured up the other day, if we added up the killed and wounded in Democrat wars in this century, it'd be about 1.6 million Americans, enough to fill the city of Detroit. Now, if we want to go back and rake that over and over and over, we can do that. I assume Senator Mondale doesn't want to do that. But it seems to me that the pardon of Richard Nixon is behind us. Watergate's behind us. If we have this vision for America, and if we're really concerned about those people out there and their problems, yes, and their education and their jobs, we ought to be talking about that. I know it strikes a responsive chord for some to kick Richard Nixon around. I don't know how long you can keep that up. How much mileage is there in someone who's been kicked, whose wife suffered a serious stroke, who's been disgraced in office and stepped down from that office? And I think after two years and some months that it's probably a dead issue. But let them play that game. That's the only game they know. Senator Mondale. I think uh, Senator Dole has richly earned his reputation as a hatchet man tonight. Bob Dole was criticized for his lack of rhetorical ability during the 1996 GOP primaries. Lamar Alexander wondered out loud if Dole could match verbal skills on the same stage with President Bill Clinton. This program shall examine questions and answers from the two 1996 presidential debates. Dole would positively critique his own abilities, but were expectations lowered enough? Could GOP spinmeisters overcome polling data indicating Dole was a big loser? Should the media play up presidential debates in sports rhetoric? Wins, losses, knockout punch. What follows is a video verite perspective of Dole and Clinton, including analyses from those debates. Well, because the reason I say you should think twice before attacking the president is, is that they've attacked this president with the most malicious, mean-spirited, hateful, vulgar attacks that any politician in modern times have gone through, and he has a 17-point lead. It looks like the message is, is these attacks are not working, that the, the, the American public sees the president, they see a guy that can take a punch, that can keep smiling and keep focused, and it plays right into sort of the whole Dole, Jesse Helms, Pat Robinson, Rush Limbaugh, and Newt Gingrich Republican Party, that all it is is hateful and mean-spirited, and all they want to do is tear everything down. They don't stand for anything. They don't have any sense of optimism, any sense of hope. It's well, just rip everybody up, and that's fine. If he wants to do that, tell him to go ahead, but I think he ought to be a deal in hope. I think he ought right. to be like Eisenhower and Reagan as opposed to Gingrich and that whole silly crowd they got up there right now. Mike Murphy, are you going to take that? No, that was, a, that was a pretty good haymaker from James. The fact <laughs> is, the great, the great opportunity for Senator Dole here is in this debate, he gets Clinton out from the fortress-like Clinton campaign and right in front where they can have some differences and 100 million people get to, get to see them both. Clinton's been spending about 95% of his advertising money on negative ads. Well, there's all that bark's going to get stripped away, and people are going to take a real look at Clinton and a real look at Dole. The expectations are all of Clinton. I mean, the great performance art president. He'll feel pain. He'll maybe do some magic tricks. But if Dole can get it one-on-one -on -one and have people focus on both guys, it's a real opportunity for him, and I think he'll do pretty well. The president said in his opening statement, we are better off today than we were four years ago. Do you agree? Well, he's better off than he was four years ago. <laughs> I agree with that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I may be better off four years from now, but... I don't know. I look at uh, the slowest growth in a century. He inherited a growth of 4.7, 4.8%. Now it's down about 2.4%. We're going to pass a million bankruptcies this year for the first time in history. We've got stagnant wages. In fact, women's wages have dropped 2.2 percent. Men's wages haven't gone up, gone down. So we have stagnation. We have the highest foreign debt in history. And it seems to me that uh, if you take a look, are you better off? Well, I guess uh, some may be better off. Saddam Hussein is probably better off than he was four years ago. Rene Preval is probably better off than he was four years ago. But are the American people? They're working harder and higher and harder and paying more taxes. For the first time in history, you pay about 40% of what you earn. 
more than you spend for food, clothing, and shelter combined for taxes under this administration. So some may be better off. They talk about family income being up. That's not true in Connecticut. Family income is down. And it's up in some cases because both parents are working. One works for the family, and one works to pay taxes for the government. We're going to give them a tax cut so they can spend more time with their children, maybe even take a vacation. That's what America is all about. That's right. Well, let, let me say, first of all, in February, Senator Dole acknowledged that the American economy was in the best shape it's been in in 30 years. We have 10 and a half million more jobs, a faster job growth rate than under any Republican administration since the 1920s. Wages are going up for the first time in a decade. We have record numbers of new small businesses. We had the biggest drop in the number of people in poverty in 27 years. All groups of people are growing. We had the biggest drop in income inequality in 27 years in 1995. The average family's income has gone up over $1,600 just since our economic plan passed. So I think it's clear that we're better off than we were four years ago. Now we need to focus on what do we need to do to be better off still? How can we help people as we are to get their retirements uh, when they work for small businesses, to be able to afford health insurance, to be able to educate their children? That's what I want to focus on. But we're clearly better off than we were four years ago, as Senator Dole acknowledged this year. But it seems to me the record is clear. The record is pretty clear in Arkansas when your governor drug use doubled. You resisted the appointment of a drug czar there because you thought it might interfere with treatment. But here you cut the drug czar's office 83 percent. You cut interdiction substantially. I mean, that's what you, I want to stop it from coming across the border. And in my administration, we're going to train the National Guard to stop it from coming across the border. Now, this is an invasion of drugs from all over the world. And we have a responsibility. You had a surgeon, or before General McCaffrey, you had a lady who said we ought to consider legalizing drugs. Is that the kind of leadership we need? And I won't comment on other things that have happened in your administration or your past about drugs. But it seems to me that the kids ought to, if they, have a, if they started, they ought to stop and just don't do it. Mr. President? Let me say again, we did have a drug czar in Arkansas, but he answered to the governor just like this one answers to the president. That's what I thought we ought to do. Secondly, Senator Dole, you voted against the crime bill that had the death penalty for drug kingpins in it, and you voted to cut services to 23 million school children under the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Act. I don't think that means you're soft on drugs. We just have a different approach. But let me remind you that my family has suffered from drug abuse. I know what it's like to see somebody you love nearly lose their lives, and I hate drugs, Senator. We need to do this together, and we can. Senator Dole, we've talked mostly now about differences between the two of you that relate to policy issues and that sort of thing. Are there also significant differences in the more personal area that are relevant to this election? Uh, let me say first on the president's promise for another tax cut. I mean, I've told people as I travel around, all you got the, the tax cut he promised last time, vote for him in 96. And not many hands go up. So the question, would you buy a used election promise from my opponent? The people want economic reform. They're having a hard time making ends meet. You got one parent working for the government, the other parent working for the family. And this is important business. This is about getting the economy moving again. This is about American jobs and opportunities. It's about the government, as I said before, pinching its pennies for a change instead of the poor taxpayer. When they raise your taxes, nobody runs around asking people, where are you going to get the extra money? I think the government can do better. Are there personal differences? That are, that are relevant to this? Well, area. my blood pressure is lower and my weight, my cholesterol, but I will not make health an issue in this campaign. <laughs> so, I think he's... He's a bit taller than I am, but uh, I think there are personal differences. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't like to get into personal matters. As far as I'm concerned, this is a campaign about issues. It's about my vision for America and about his liberal vision for America, and not about personal things. And I think his liberal vision is a thing of the past. I know he wants to disown it. I, I wouldn't want to be a liberal either, Mr. President, but you're stuck with it because that's, that's your record. It's your record in Arkansas, the biggest tax increase in history, biggest crime increase in history, biggest drug increase in history in Arkansas. Mr. President. 
Well, just for the record, when I was governor, we had the lowest, uh, second lowest tax burden of any state in the country, the highest job growth rate of any state when I ran for president, and we're widely recognized for a lot of other advances. But the important thing is, what are we going to do now? But as the President of the United States, when somebody asks you about pardons, you say no comment, period. And I think he made a mistake. And I think uh, when you make a mistake, you say, I made a mistake. But apparently his position hasn't changed. So if there are other specific areas, but beyond that, I've, I haven't gotten into any of these things, as the President knows. We've had that discussion. And I've, again, I know Senator Motto, I think, may have had a hearing or two on Whitewater, I can't remember. But uh, he's not my general chairman, he's a friend of mine. And so is Senator Kennedy, a friend of yours. And you bet. I remember one day on the floor, I said, now, gentlemen, let me tax your memories. And Kennedy jumped up and said, why haven't we thought of that before? You know, <laughs> so, so one, of, one of your liberal friends. Uh, Thank you. Mr. President, 30 seconds. No comment. <laughs> First it was leaving the Senate, then it was picking Jack Kemp, then it was the tax cut idea. Uh, there's always some sort of surprise uh, uh, gimmick. It's, it's B. Benson, he's reinvented the flat tire in this campaign. I mean, every time he tries to breathe air into something, he gets into trouble again, and then they come up with a new idea. So I presume they'll get together and try and figure out some new idea to get with 30 days to go. But again, I come back to the point. Where are you going to take the country? What positive ideas do you have to lead the nation? And if you don't have anything positive to say, uh, then people are going to turn off, frankly. Now, going into this one, you know, we heard the stories that Dole was going to come out slashing. Right. I never believed that. He wasn't about to make the mistake he made 20 years ago. <laughs> I guess not, but, but let me ask you this then. It seemed to me, watching the debate, that this was very, very heavily issues-oriented more than anything else. Do you think maybe... Uh, that turn people off or do you no. think that this is a, a type of election which issues really don't matter anymore and it has to do with the two men you said no let me start with you Ms. Bebis Jeff. Well, Sally, there's a difference between issues and details I think mm. voters do want to hear about issues they do want to hear about vision about direction about themes and to some extent about plans to solve problems but eyes do, do glaze over when, they, when you start hearing statistics and ups mm -hmm. and downs and percentages. And I think that may have been a part of the problem. At times, the debate really did border on the policy wonkish. I, I suppose it did. Well, th then what can we expect coming up in the next debate, do you think? Let me stay with you, Ms. Mavis Jeff. In, in the next presidential mm -hmm. debate? Right. Well, let's, let's face it. We didn't see a debate tonight, and we're certainly not going to see a debate in the next presidential debate. It's going to be a town hall forum. It is Bill Clinton's Metier. Right. And I think that Bob Dole had to come a little bit farther than he did tonight to catch up to the president in a town hall forum. We did not have a former president of the United States in the audience. Mr. President, I hereby designate you Hall Monitor. <laughs> you have my permission, sir, to whack anybody who gets out of line. Now, what this means, practically, is that in a few minutes, the, uh, Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Dole are going to come in. They're going to sit back up there. Feel free to applaud when that happens. I'll tell you when that's going to happen. And, uh, and then, a few minutes after that, their husbands are going to come in. And I will introduce them. Feel free to applaud. And then I, they will take their positions here at the podium. And, uh, and then I will count you all. You can... You know, feel free to talk to your neighbor for a while, and then I'll start counting you down to silence. Okay, six o'clock, straight up, is when we go silent. The networks then go on the air, and in about a minute, 15 seconds after that, I say good evening. The, uh, uh, the two candidates will make two-minute opening statements, and then we'll go to the first question from the folks on the stage, and then we will do that until there are about five minutes left and then the two candidates will make closing statements, okay? Have I got a deal? Yep. Thank you very much. These are the ideals and morals that we are, teach we are trying to teach our children in these days, um, yet we don't seem to be practicing them in our government in anything. If you are president 
how will you begin to practice what we are preaching to our children, the future of our nation? Well, I would say, first of all, I think it's a very good question. I appreciate the quote from the young man. There's no doubt about it that many American people have lost their faith in government. They see scandals almost on a daily basis. They see ethical problems in the White House today. They see 900 FBI files, private person being gathered up by somebody in the White House. Nobody knows who hired this man. So there's a great deal of cynicism out there. But I've always tried, and whatever I've done, is to bring people together. I said in my acceptance speech in San Diego about two months ago, that the exits are clearly marked. If you think the Republican Party is some place for you to come, if you're narrow-minded or bigoted or don't like certain people in America, the exits are clearly marked for you to walk out of as I stand here without compromise, because this is the party of Lincoln. I think we have a real obligation, obviously public officials. I'm no longer a public official. I left public life on June the 11th of this year. But it is very important. Young people are looking to us. They're looking to us for leadership. They're watching what we do, what we say, what we promise, and what we finally deliver. And I would think, it seems to me, that there are opportunities here. When I'm president of the United States, I will keep my word. My word is my bond. Mr. President. One of the reasons that I ran for president, Sandy, is because not just children, a lot of grown-ups felt that way. And if you remember, four years ago we had not only rising unemployment, but a lot of rising cynicism. I'd never worked in Washington as an elected official. It seemed to me that uh, most of the arguments were partisan, Republican, Democrat, left, right, liberal, conservative. That's why I said tonight I'm for opportunity, responsibility, and community. And we've gotten some real progress in the last four years. I've also done everything I could at every moment of division in this country, after Oklahoma City, when these churches were burned, to bring people together and remind people that we are stronger because of our diversity. We have to respect one another. You mentioned Washington and Lincoln. They were presidents at historic times. This is an historic time. It's important that we go beyond those old partisan arguments and focus on people and their future. When we do that, Instead of shutting the government down over a partisan fight on the budget, we're a better country, and that's why we're making progress now. Honor, duty, and country. That's what America's all about. Certainly the President of the United States, in the highest office in the world, the most important office in the world, has a responsibility to young people, as we talked about earlier, to everyone, by example. And when it comes to public ethics, he has a responsibility. When you have 30-some in your administration who have either left or being investigated or in jail or whatever, then you've got an ethical problem. It's public ethics. I'm not talking about private. We're talking about public ethics. When you have 900 files gathered up by some guy who was a bouncer in a bar and hired a security officer to collect files in Watergate, I know a person who went to jail for looking at one file one FBI file. There are 900 sequestered in the White House. 900 people like you. Why should they be rifling through your files? So the president has a great responsibility. And it's one that I understand and certainly carry out. This is the most uh, religious great country in history and yet interestingly enough we have the most religious freedom of any country in the world including the freedom not to believe and now we have all these people just up the road in Los Angeles County we've got people from 150 different racial and ethnic groups and they've got tons of different religions but the fundamental tenets of virtually every religion are the same and what I've tried to do is to support policies that would respect religion and then help parents inculcate those values to their children. All right, now we go to the closing statements. Senator Dole, your first two minutes, sir. Well, let me thank everybody here at the <clears throat> university, and Jim, thank you, all the people who 
may still be watching or viewing. This is what it's all about. It's not about me. It's not about President Clinton. It's about the process. It's about selecting a president of the United States. So we have our differences. We should have our differences. I mentioned other parties, they have their differences. We all agreed it'd be a pretty dull place. We should have more debates. Maybe we'll have another debate on, on the economy. But I would just say this. This is the highest honor that I've ever had in my life, to think that somebody from Russell, Kansas, somebody who grew up living in a basement apartment, somebody whose parents didn't finish high school, somebody who spent about 39 months in hospitals after World War II, somebody who uses a button hook every day to get dressed, somebody who understands that the real Americans out there with real problems, whether they're soccer moms or the sing single parents or families working, or seniors, or people with disabilities, wherever it may be. But there's some very fundamental differences in this campaign. President Clinton opposes term limits. President Clinton opposes Constitution Amendment to balance the budget. President Clinton opposes voluntary prayer amendment. He opposes the amendment to protect the flag of the United States of America. People give their lives. A couple of servicemen here, they sacrifice. They give everything for America. We ought to protect the American flag with a constitutional amendment. But beyond that, we need to address the economy. And I would just say my time running out here, it's a very proud moment for me. And what I want the voters to do is to make a decision. And I want them to be proud of their vote in the years ahead. Proud that they voted for the right candidate. Proud that they voted, hopefully, for me. And I'll just make you one promise. My word is good. Democrats and Republicans that work said Bob Dole's word is good. I keep my word. I promise you the economy is going to get better. We're going to have a good economic package. And we're going into the next century a better America. Thank you. Now, viewers of last night's debate thought Mr. Clinton won by an even more decisive margin, by 30 points. So why did Clinton win so decisively? The president's message was, look at the record. We need a good, strong economic package. Let the private sector create the jobs, and they can do it. If, if you believe that the California economy was better in 1992 than it is today, you should vote for Bob Dole. Bob Dole's message was, if you think you can trust this guy, then vote for him. Now, the president doesn't have any ideas, so he's out trashing ours. This isn't going to blow a hole in the deficit. He promised you a tax cut in 1992. And if you got one, sir, you ought to vote for him. Clinton won on his performance as president and our polling shows in the debate. Now, voters still have doubts about his character, but they do not have many doubts about President Clinton's abilities as a problem solver. President Clinton's message is, I solved the problem that I was elected to solve, the economy. And if you re-elect me, I'll solve more problems. So far, for most voters, President Clinton's character has not become a major problem. So what happens in the campaign now? Well, the overwhelming majority of voters, including half of those now voting for Dole, believe President Clinton is going to win. Now the contest will shift to the House of Representatives, ground zero of the Republican Revolution. Our poll taken over the weekend shows a 10-point lead for the Democrats nationwide. If Dole loses, he doesn't want to bring down the Republican Congress with him. It's his Congress, too, and his reputation. It would be terrible for Dole to end up in the history books as the man who ended the Reagan Revolution. Dole's overall debate performances were sound. He missed obvious chances to criticize Clinton directly on perceived or real scandals in the first debate. Dole worked well with questioners in the give and take of the town hall debate. However, to make critical evaluations of Clinton, he should have looked directly at the president and established eye contact. Looking away does not reinforce negative points as well. In the end, Bob Dole did his best in the 1996 presidential debates. His misfortune was to be up against an opponent who, especially in the town hall format, proved to be exceptionally quick on his feet. President Clinton's debate coach, former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell of Maine, deserves particular credit for keeping Clinton's demeanor in check, calm and bipartisan in tone.